Welcome everybody to this second uh, public lecture provided by the Department for Cultural and Social History here at Elisimatu Safik. I'm also welcoming those who are watching us on, on Elisimatu Safik's YouTube channel. We are happy that both you are here tonight and all the other guys who are following us digitally. However, especially happy I am to welcome Adam Grühehoy. Um, he has been a frequent guest in Nuuk for the last uh, couple of years. He has since 2014, I think, been a guest lecturer at the Department for Social Sciences. And I think it's already his fifth or even sixth time that Adam is staying with us in Nuuk for a couple of weeks. During his last stay in October 2016, Adam showed me some of his recent writings and among those, a journal article based on field work and a number of interviews that he had conducted while staying here in Nuuk. When reading it, I thought that his arguments should gain a wider public than the admittedly rather small group of people who usually read such journal articles. I believe that Adam in his paper touches some important issues that all of us here in Nuuk can relate to in one way or the other. And therefore, I'm really happy that Adam immediately said yes to my request to share his thoughts with us. And I'm also very happy that many of you obviously found the topic interesting enough to show up tonight. Adam Grühehoy was born and raised in Miami in the United States, but has since become an island dweller. He has a PhD in ethnology from the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, and he studies the interactions between culture, politics, and economy in island communities worldwide. He has researched islands in Scotland, in Norway, Denmark, China, Taiwan, Indonesia, and thus he can provide a comparative perspective on Greenlandic culture and politics. After some time in the United uh, Kingdom and on the island of Eru, Adam is now based on the island of Armagh, Copenhagen, Denmark, where he is the director of the Island Dynamic Research Organization and editor of Island Studies Journal. But besides his frequent stays here in Nuuk as a visiting professor at Ilesima Tusafik, he is also a research associate at the University of Prince Edward Island in Canada and has prior been affiliated to the universities of Lund in Sweden and of Hong Kong. Adam has published widely on aspects like center and periphery, indigeneity, decolonization, autonomy movements, globalization, local identity, and tourism. He has also written about urban development here in Nuuk. If one should identify a common theme of his numerous uh, contributions to books and articles, it probably would be that they in one way or another focus on islands. Today, Adam will talk about the current relationship between Greenland and Denmark. Among the dozens of highly autonomous overseas territories in the world today, he says, only Greenland possesses an overwhelming public desire for independence. He investigates what Adam calls Denmark and Greenland's competing but cooperatively constructed national identities. Before Greenland can become truly independent, Adam argues, it must overcome its culture of dependence. As you might have uh, seen, we are facing some technical uh, challenges. So. Yes, there, was, there actually was a PowerPoint uh, presentation which we unfortunately will not be able to show. So I hope you won't mind. And I can already tell you that after the lecture, which is, which is starting in a second, we will take a short break and have some coffee and some cake and some tea. And then we have plenty of times for questions and discussion. But now I'm very much looking forward to your presentation, Adam. And yeah, the floor is yours. And I hope this one will work at least for the rest of, of the evening. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, thank you so much, Ebba, for, for the wonderful uh, introduction. I'll just ask you all to imagine the beautiful photos um, uh, that, that otherwise would come up uh, 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 on the screen. It's a bit uh, daunting for me to be here in front of you all speaking about this topic, because this is something which virtually everyone in the room who isn't an American exchange student um, knows much more about than I do. Uh, but I, I hope that I'll uh, sort of be able to offer maybe a, a, a slightly different kind of perspective, maybe, uh, than, than, than we often get on this sort of subject, partially because of my vaunted outsider status. Um, I, 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 I do speak Danish, I should mention, uh, 
been living in Denmark since 2002, uh, primarily. Uh, but uh, sometimes it's uh, it's sort of interesting to, to to see things from the kind of non-Danish and uh, in this case also non-Greenlandic eyes. As Ebbe mentioned, sort of a key point in, in 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 my research and and one of the sort of key points that I wrote about in this paper, which he mentioned, plenty of copies for folks to pick up uh, after the talk if you're interested, is uh, that there are many many islands worldwide uh, which are remote from usually their former colonial powers. Uh, in fact, uh, just since World War II alone, there have been 33 new small island states uh, which, which, which formed um, sort of with the withdrawal of the colonial empires. But besides that, we have about 38 what I would call highly autonomous uh, subnational island jurisdictions. So these usually former colonies uh, which, uh, um, which have not become independent uh, from, from their colonizers. Uh, or often from some other state with which they've been associated afterwards. And it's sort of taken as a given within the island studies uh, uh, a community after research over the previous uh, few decades that uh, there seem to be some, certain, some sort of advantages which are associated with not becoming an independent state. Now the causality of this is, is a little bit difficult to fathom sometimes. But uh, when we look at uh, various economic and, 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 and social factors, uh, it seems that, uh, that these non-sovereign small island communities, again, almost all of them former colonies, uh, really outperform the sovereign island states uh, in, in, in virtually everything. And there also seems to be this association with small population size and non-sovereignty. So the very smallest of these uh, small island remote territories, uh, most of them end up not becoming sovereign states and for whatever reason, and various explanations have been given, uh, they tend to sort of perform better in, in these sort of quantitative senses. Now, those are just the numbers, of course, but it, it, it raises an, 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 an interesting question here about what it is that makes Greenland different precisely. Because uh, as Ebbe mentioned, Greenland's basically alone uh, among these various places and having an overwhelming public desire for independence at some point uh, in the future. We could see uh, a, a poll was, was just carried out earlier this year and, and published in, 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 in Semitiak uh, on Friday, showing I believe it was a 71% overall desire for independence. Here in the Greenlandic context, we often take this for granted, that this is the kind of things which societies like Greenland ultimately aim for. And I'd say among the sort of general public uh, uh, around the world, it's kind of the idea that places like Greenland have a, a kind of trajectory toward political independence. But what we see in reality, looking at communities like Greenland, which have a lot of, let's say, exceptional powers uh, relative to a normal part of a normal country, uh, is that uh, there isn't usually this uh, high desire for independence anymore. Uh, the wave of island independence movements basically petered out and stopped in the 1980s. Since 1984, there have only been two uh, small uh, island states which have been, been formed, and one of them was as a result of a quite bloody civil war. Uh, so that is a little bit different than, than the Greenlandic case. Just within the past, uh, I believe, 10 years or so, there have been uh, 12 different independence referendums uh, or referenda in small island communities which are non-sovereign, uh, and they've all failed. The general publics in most places, like Greenland, uh, do not want independence. And as I say, there are, are various uh, you know, uh, reasons which are given for this from some kind of understanding of financial benefits, maybe. Uh, of, of having association with the, with the former colonizer. Uh, but it's not entirely known uh, uh, why these processes are going on. This made me think about what it is which makes Greenland special, it's something which I started thinking about uh, when I first came here in 2014. And it's uh, something which, which I wrote about in this paper, and this is just, just written last year. But I have to say that uh, I've had a, a bit of change of heart um, in, in some ways since I wrote this. I'm not saying that I wrote things which are incorrect, but maybe that's just one version of correctness, that there are certain, uh, 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 certain problems that, that come when people like me, people like a lot of us in, in this room, uh, come in from the outside with our expert knowledge. I'm not going to uh, give some kind of uh, uh, no experts allowed speech here, um, but that we might have a different kind of knowledge and a different kind of understanding of what's needed when we look at numbers, when we look at things in some comparative sense, without really thinking about uh, some of the deeper cultural factors involved. 
In this paper, the basic argument which I make is uh, uh, it ultimately boils down to uh, uh, it could be clever for, for the Greenlandic public to somehow some kind of to somehow have some sort of mindset change, uh, which would allow Greenlanders to feel much like people do in, uh, in most of these other communities like Greenland around the world, that uh, there are benefits to being able to exploit the former colonial power and feel that you're actually taking advantage of them, which in many ways is sort of the opposite of the situation, uh, uh, which is here now, that for whatever reason, Greenland hasn't quite developed this sense of exploiting Denmark in the way that, for example, uh, the, uh, the, the former Dutch colonies have about the Netherlands uh, and, and so on. But as I say, I, uh, I, I might have some, some slightly different feelings uh, about where some of the responsibility for this moving forward lies, uh, which, which I'll try to get into in this little presentation. <laughs> yeah, sorry, uh, trying to figure out all, all my slides here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, a sort of primary argument which, which I'd like to, like to bring up here is, is that we, 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 we speak of Greenland, and I'm going to be looking at Greenland now as, a, as, as, an, as an island territory, which I know uh, 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 most Greenlanders don't think of it that way, but from some kind of international comparative perspective, it makes a lot of sense, because even though this is a very large island, or rather group of islands, uh, it has a rather small population, which is in many ways comparable. Uh, to many of these other sort of non-sovereign territories. And also, um, because Greenland has this island geography, we have a different way of imagining it uh, when we look at Greenland on a map. Of course, according to sort of Western science, it's only in the late 1800s uh, that it was truly realized that Greenland was indeed some kind of island surrounded by water and ice and so on. But in this sense, something which I think is, is, is important to, to, to sort of remember uh, uh, in the sense of, of what is Greenlandic national identity, or how do Greenlanders uh, feel about themselves, is that Greenland, sort of as we know it today, is, is kind of a creation of the colonial encounter. Of course, there were people living here uh, with, with their own culture and, 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 and different groups and families and uh, um, a, 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 a strong society. Uh, but I would uh, rather hypothesize uh, that uh, there wasn't truly a sense of, of Greenlandicness prior to the arrival of Europeans. There was simply us, there was no them, there was no kind of relative sense of, of, uh, of, of being outside, uh, 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 basically. No sense of center periphery relationships of being remote. Um, people had a culture, uh, but there wasn't a sense of this wider Greenlandic culture, because that's all there was. Now I'd like you to have a little experiment here and close your eyes for a moment. Oh, really, it's terribly important you actually have to close them. Excellent. Now, I'd like you to imagine that's the year 1720. Mm. Life is difficult. You know, it's, 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 it's a hard life. Uh, people have to work very hard to, to manage to, to get by. Now, the lifespan, the average lifespan is just about 40 years. Uh, that's, that's a sort of, uh, um, a sort of, sort of estimate as a kind of the, at, at, the, at the upper level of, of how long the average person lived. Uh, about one in four children never made it past the age of 15, a very high infant and child mortality rate. There was a strong patriarchal society in which it was men who decided almost everything. And there was a strong belief that surrounding people out in nature, there were dangerous spirits, uh, which, uh, which sort of uh, uh, sculpted the way that many people live their lives. Now, just, uh, just 10 years before, so this is in... Uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in around 1710, there had been an outbreak of, 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 of mass disease, which killed about a third of the population in the most densely populated areas. And for the previous 20 years, there had been um, a, a, a series of difficult interconnected wars between the, 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 the various tribes in the region. Uh, only the elite, of course, this time received any sort of education. The king died of tuberculosis in 1730, his son died at the age of, uh, of, uh, of, let's see, of, 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 of 47. And his son's son, uh, the next king, uh, died of alcohol-related illness uh, at the age of 42, as a friend of mine says, after having been drunk for his entire adult life. Of course, I'm not speaking about Greenland now. This is Denmark. But it's an interesting way of seeing things, 
because uh, normally when we think about the meeting between Greenland and Denmark, we don't think about that Denmark. We don't think about the Denmark of 1720. We think about the Denmark of today. You could open your eyes now, by the way. Um, <laughs> so the, 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 the question uh, sort of becomes, you know, we often talk about what happened when Greenland became modern, but we could also ask what happened when Denmark became modern. When did Denmark actually become modern? Because this isn't the Denmark that we think of when we're thinking about the colonial encounter. Now, I would say maybe in some ways Denmark became modern through its meeting with Greenland as well. It's a bit interesting to try thinking about these things in this way. And now, there, there, there's sort of this, this, I, this idea in Denmark that Denmark was sort of a, uh, the ideal colonizer, was the perfect colonial power. Well, you know, Denmark had some problematic colonies, uh, in particular in the Danish West Indies, um, uh, on the African Gold Coast, uh, Ghana, you know, and, uh, and in, in India itself. But, you know, I'm willing to say, for the sake of argument here, that Denmark actually was not a particularly bad colonial power when it came to Greenland. Uh, as the Danes are quite proud of saying, there, there weren't the executions, uh, there wasn't actually slavery, and so on. But even bearing all this in mind, uh, my argument would be that uh, colonization, colonialism, coloniality always have some kind of impact. And uh, it uh, always, in some senses, has, has a negative impact. Uh, for one thing, and, and this is speaking in really abstract terms, there's the introduction of Western understanding of the world, which uh, it, it doesn't replace, but it supplements and overlies um, what, what existed before. So what does this actually mean in practice? Well, to use a sort of a, a, a very foreign example here, which doesn't involve islands at all, actually, uh, uh, as is often spoken about in the literature, the, the Incans of, of South America, uh, the mountain kingdom, uh, actually viewed the world in, in sort of vertical terms, as opposed to our usual horizontal mapping that we think. This makes a lot of sense from the Incan culture, uh, in as much as depending on where you are on the mountain, you do things at different time periods, uh, you do different activities, which affects the activities below you. Of course, when the Incans were colonized, and many of them died, but uh, those who survived, of course, had to adapt to a different European system of actually way of seeing the world. We can see these examples in, uh, in, in Polynesia, uh, in the Pacific uh, as well, in which uh, uh, people had, had navigational skills, uh, which, uh, which were beyond any abilities uh, uh, in Europe at the time. People living on what today we think of as small remote islands actually had the ability to, uh, to travel thousands of miles, uh, or thousands of kilometers even. Um, that was my Americanism showing through there. Um, um, it, to, to other islands and so on through knowledge of the stars and the currents and the winds. And of course, this is what happened until European colonialism put everyone in little boxes on the map, uh, which of course stops uh, uh, travel uh, in this way. And it's through the colonization process that these, uh, these South Pacific Islanders end up becoming people living on remote islands rather than to use Epele uh, 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 term, um, uh, uh, um, you know, living within a sea of islands rather than islands in a sea. So we could ask, in this sense, uh, you know, whether or not there might have been a Greenlandic understanding of Greenland, which makes much more sense than trying to put a Danish understanding of, 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 of Greenland onto the world here. And I think it's probably more or less impossible to look back to what people actually thought, actually believed in prior to the European encounter uh, here, although uh, obviously the culture doesn't entirely disappear, so we could sort of uh, 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 make some guesses and uh, and, and gain some inspiration from what we could still see. But even within this relatively benign sense of, 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 Danish, uh, of Danish colonialism, of course the, uh, the, um, the colonization of, of, of Greenland involved the, the colonial administrators and so on, identifying certain elements of Greenland culture to eradicate or to preserve. And of course the, the preservation of certain parts of Greenland, Greenland culture, something uh, that I guess um, some Danes who know a bit about the history of, 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 of Greenland can, can take some pride in. But uh, just because you preserve certain elements of culture doesn't mean that their meanings are the same. Uh, uh, we can see with the example of, 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 the, uh, of the drum dance, uh, which was uh, partially revived and, and was, uh, was deployed uh, ultimately by, uh, by, by colonial authorities um, in order to serve colonial purposes. Ultimately, you have a sort of uh, uh, the introduction of, of a market economy uh, uh, in Greenland. Even if people were being encouraged to undertake traditional activities, such as seal hunting, suddenly it became 
uh, uh, part of the process of economic uh, exploitation, the introduction of what we might call s uh, surplus labor uh, with, uh, with people hunting more than they needed to and in different ways uh, in order to gain certain, uh, 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 certain goods and benefits um, from, from, from the colonizers. And, uh, and these things fundamentally change the culture, even if we could say visually, if, even if individual elements remain the same. Now, what's important to remember in all this is that, you know, we could say certain changes were good, certain changes were bad, but these aren't changes which Greenlanders themselves chose. It's something uh, which, which came to them from the outside. That doesn't mean that people lacked agency, that people lacked the ability to react to things. Uh, but, uh, but the very fact that they had to react is, uh, is, 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 is something which has an effect on the society. I'm going to quote from the uh, Maori uh, uh, academic from New Zealand, Linda Smith here, who says of the sort of colonial process that we had absolute authority over our lives. We were born into and lived in a universe which was entirely of our making. We did not ask, need, or want to be discovered by Europe, uh, regardless of, of any of the positive or negative impacts of, 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 of colonization. This was an intrusion. This was a, 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 a breach of a pre-existing culture which had its own universe, its own, its own way of doing things. Now, I, uh, I, 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 I mentioned before the, the rather bad situations uh, uh, in Denmark uh, at the time of, of the sort of colonial encounter, that the Denmark that we imagine uh, is not, not the Denmark that was there then. Um, and yet when we usually sort of compare um, uh, 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 the Greenlandic experience to the Danish experience. Well, we know that in 1721, uh, the, the, the Danes uh, weren't, uh, weren't eating at, uh, at hipster restaurants in Kulpun. Um, but, 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 but somehow it doesn't really become part of the picture of, of what's going on. And it's almost as though Danishness is always now. Danishness is always what's happening right now. It's always the modern, it's always the up-to-date. But Greenlandicness, by some strange mental process, I'd say on, on the part of, of both many Greenlanders and many Danes, Greenlandicness is stuck in 1721. We sort of imagine as though Greenlandicness is this, uh, this pre-colonial world, whereas Danishness keeps moving forward, which makes it difficult to make any kind of real comparison, any kind of real thinking about what's actually happening. And in this, in this sense, Greenlandicness has been sort of delegitimized because it's not that, uh, that the average Greenlander thinks that Greenlandicness is bad, but Greenlandicness uh, uh, in this sort of uh, way of viewing things is, is something which no one actually wants to live today. Uh, they're, 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 there's no one who actually wants to live the sort of the, 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 the nomadic hunting lifestyle, uh, which was going on uh, uh, prior to, to, to colonization. So you get this sort of inappropriate comparison here. And uh, in this sense, the, the present and future Greenland um, is always quite damaged now, I would say. It's always Danish. Uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to imagine a, a sort of Greenland that isn't somehow culturally Danish, as though everything that came after this period uh, is somehow some kind of Danish invention. But obviously, that's not entirely true. I mean, we might think of, of coffee, something which, 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 which came to Greenland relatively recently. Uh, obviously not in 1721, but coffee, despite not being a Danish invention at all, somehow becomes part of Danish culture when it's transplanted to Greenland. Uh, things such as art and writing and shopping centers and escalators, again, not actually Danish things at all, but in the Greenlandic context, these are Danish. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm being a little bit frivolous here, maybe. I'm being a little bit silly. Uh, these are these are sort of strange examples to take uh, as as Denmark kind of mentally claiming uh, all all of progress, all of the things that it brought as being part of its culture, because of course there are some things which 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 Denmark has has kind of mentally allowed Greenlanders to take on from themselves, things which Denmark brought to Greenland, such as alcohol, and political corruption, and drug addiction, and center periphery inequalities and lack of education. These were things which didn't exist in Greenland at all, of course, before the beginning of the colonial process. And yet somehow, although all the positive things belong to Denmark in this mental image, uh, these negative things manage to be things which, which Greenlanders can claim for themselves. It's a little bit unfair. I had a very funny photo to go with that one. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm going to quote here from, from from the post-colonial theorist, uh, or, or decolonial theorist, he would call himself, Walter Mignolo, um, uh, from Argentina, 
right, which he states that coloniality is constitutive of modernity. There is no modernity without coloniality. And it, this is not only in the sense that, uh, that we couldn't have our modern Europe were not for the riches that Europe took from first South and Central America, um, and, and, and then from, from, from North America and Asia and so on. But uh, we, we don't even really have our imagination of what the modern world is without this sort of a, a colonial process underlying it. And it's sort of funny in this sense to think that, uh, that, that one thing that Denmark has been quite successful in in terms of dealing with its colonial past is that it's sort of forgotten its other colonies. I mean, here, of course, just a few days ago, we had the, uh, the, the anniversary of, uh, of finally getting rid of the, uh, the, 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 the Danish West Indies. I think something which really comes through in all of this is that Danes don't really think about the Danish West Indies. Uh, they certainly, I, I would say, don't think about the, the African Gold Coast colony. Um, it's not part of the national consciousness at all in a way that Greenland still is. Um, uh, uh, certainly, I would say the knowledge of the, of the Danish colonies in, in India uh, must be very slight uh, uh, among Danes. And the, 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 the way that, that, that Danish society sort of reacts to, reacts to this and, and, and holds on to Greenland is, is sort of with a sense of love, which is actually quite odd from, from this international uh, colonial experience, you could say, because most, uh, most of the other uh, other uh, colonizing cultures uh, 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 don't really uh, hold on to to any sense of of actually sort of loving their former colony. If you ask the the average British person uh, uh, what they think about the British Empire, it'll be maybe some kind of defensive response about, well, it wasn't actually that bad. I mean, we gave them railroads and so on. People shouldn't complain. Um, and 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 the French may well respond with some sense of a brotherhood. Well, we're all in it together now. Uh, but that's really quite distinct from, from what happens when Danes start talking about Greenland. Now, of course, I'm generalizing here. Um, uh, some of my best friends are Danes. Uh, and, and, and obviously, this, uh, this doesn't count for, 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 for all Danes. And so what I say about Greenland doesn't count for all Greenlanders. But sometimes generalizations can be fun to think with. Uh, there are other scholars, I'm thinking particularly of uh, Kirsten Tiestad and Ulrich Kram Gell, who have been looking at uh, the ways in which uh, um, in which uh, the Danish love for Greenland is often presented in sort of a, a parent-child terms, uh, the idea of, 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 of the Danish parents loving the Greenlandic child. And of course, it's also mixed with a sense of disappointment, because who isn't just a little bit disappointed in their children sometimes? But I'd say uh, from the perspective of this continuing sort of colonial relationship between Denmark and Greenland, it's actually, it's, it's really quite tricky, because it's easy enough as a colonized people to to sort of come to terms with, with some really annoying people who, who don't show any love for you. Um, uh, you know, they're easy enough maybe even to hate. But how do you actually deal with a former colonial power uh, which, which keeps telling them how much they love you? Uh, it's, it's, it's much more difficult maybe to break some of these sort of emotional cultural bonds. I'll quote from Jens Hoylon here, who, uh, who, who, who writing uh, uh, decades ago, um, uh, is uh, and 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 looking back at the uh, at the activities with the official decolonization of Greenland um, uh, through uh, from the 40s uh, through through the 50s, stated that perhaps the Danish public simply did not wish to lose Greenland as an emotional object. The idea that it was impossible in his mind for the Danish public to have a normal sort of, as he puts it, a rational debate about Greenland and about what Greenland should become, because there was this desire to hold on to Greenland as sort of our very own developing country, a place that we could be proud of, a place that could be ours. Um, and, and I think a, a, a sort of great example of this, which, which kind of ties into to my kind of broader argument about, uh, um, about the interesting points between sovereignty and not sovereignty for highly autonomous island territories like Greenland, um, which as I say, in, in, in many parts of the world people uh, have, have for through some um, uh, 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 psychological magic trick, have managed to see themselves as exploiting their former colonizers when they receive flows of money from from uh, from 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 the old old colonial center of power. Um, but this isn't the case at all in Greenland, obviously, in which the block tisku, the block grant, is often seen as some form of continuing, uh, not oppression, but some kind of continuing continuing colonial influence, some kind of colonial domination. 
But of course, this isn't how the average Dane sees it all. For the average Dane, this is a form of selfless charity, the money of which goes to Greenland. It's something that we do for, uh, for these people who we love, who are slightly underappreciative, actually, considering how much money we keep sending them. Um, and in a similar sense, I'd, I'd, I'd say, uh, in as much as the Danish public thinks about it, there's a sort of pride um, in allowing Greenland to take its own road toward independence if that's what Greenland chooses. You know, it's a, it's a sense of see how adult we're being. But this is mingled with a disappointment because, of course, well, the, the, the very idea that the Greenlanders should choose to move toward independence anyways uh, just, uh, just shows uh, how, how ungrateful they are. Uh, that uh, that the the whole setup of, um, of 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 sort of permitting some movement toward toward independence is quite specifically meant not to be taken. I mean, it's 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 a sign of of uh, of, of the uh, Danish kindness again. Uh, that that that's possible to 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 actually uh, 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 imagine independence, but it's not actually really um, within. I'd say the 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 the, the sort of as, in, as much as we could speak of a Danish national consciousness, to, to sort of imagine why Greenlanders wouldn't want to be associated with Denmark anyway. After all, Denmark's done, done for this uh, lovely, beautiful country. In this sense, I think that Danish, the Danish self-perception, the, the, the Danish national consciousness, sort of depends on the illusion of a benign, colo uh, a benign colonialism, uh, which, which didn't harm Greenland, of course, and which actually involves Greenlanders being grateful somehow, Greenlanders being, 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 being developed from their previous, uh, from their, from their previous state. Uh, I would think it, it, it's actually uh, 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 Ebbe, who, who, who a few days ago made me think about something, um, uh, as he often does, um, uh, in, 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 in terms of uh, Denmark, you know, in, within a relatively recent history, has not necessarily been the most successful country in the world at being a great power, uh, despite these sort of visions of, of, of great powerness, you could say, of Denmark being something special. The ability to, to have this lovely little colony that we helped is, is, uh, is, is, is a good support for, for maybe a Danish cultural idea of, well, we could have been powerful if we didn't choose to be kind instead. Now, in this sense, I'd, I'd say coloniality, this whole way of, 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 of looking at colonial situations, might tend to see the world in black and white. Uh, there's this, uh, this, this dichotomy that splits it up between, of course, the Dane and the Greenlander, and, and this sort of goes, goes, goes on both sides. Um, the, the idea that, that the two can't be combined. But my, what might be even, even more difficult to come, come to terms with is, uh, is, is the, the maybe developing idea um, um, in, in, in the Danish consciousness that, well, you know, we don't see the world in black and white anymore. We just see the world in white, uh, that there's no problem uh, um, uh, with, with, with Greenlanders, of course not. We're all equal. This equality comes from the idea of Greenlanders increasingly acting like Danes in this sort of ideal mindset. Now, in all this, uh, I've, I've sort of been, been, been skirting around the point, but uh, as I've, what I've been trying to present is, is this idea that Denmark and Greenland are actually culturally dependent on each other. It doesn't mean that this is how it needed to be uh, um, or how it needs to be in the future, but this is how it is, that these senses of, 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 of own identity are, are sort of mutually constructed, that the, the sense of what Greenlandicness means today depends on this vision of, of Danishness and how Danishness came to Greenland. Um, and in a somewhat more abstract sense, but I still think a significant one, uh, the, the Danish self-perception depends on a certain vision of what actually happened in Greenland in the past and what's happening in Greenland today. Now, there are various different options here, some of which I mentioned in this paper. Uh, was uh, you know the, the the from the sort of uh, international ideal comparison uh, uh, of, of of various uh, non-sovereign island territories is that you know, Greenland could find ways of, of sort of, uh, of 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 some kind of mindset change which could allow it to retain links with Denmark um, and you know sort of free money from 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 from, from the block to the scoop and uh, and and work toward uh, some kind of further development. If, 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 if that's what, it, uh, what, what Greenland wished. But I think, uh, you know, uh, in many ways, uh, asking this is sort of asking Greenland, uh, which has been, been the victim of the process, is asking Greenland to be the adult in this relationship. Uh, whereas, in fact, I, I, I think maybe in primary 
uh, 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 responsibility for for resolving this tension um, lies on the Danish side. You know, it, it's 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 no good people like me saying uh, saying saying that it's time to move forward with things. Uh, other options are open to Greenland, of course, uh, either as a non-sovereign uh, um, uh, territory, uh, much as it is now, or as a sovereign state. Uh, Greenland could pursue different sorts of relationships uh, with, with other countries. Uh, there are a lot of states in the world that, 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 that will be, be willing to, uh, to, to sort of invest in Greenland's future in a way. We could say that, uh, that the uh, talk of, of, of self-sufficiency of being able to to produce what Greenland needs on its own um, is something which is, is is very tempting for for maybe island communities uh, 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 like Greenland and many sovereign and and non-sovereign uh, uh, small remote territories, but that might pre precisely be because it's much easier to see what comes in and out, sort of map these places uh, in our minds as 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 islands as single spaces, um, but it's not as though. Uh, for example, Denmark is dependent um, on, on, on what it produces in the sense. And also Denmark doesn't have debt. Um, these, uh, the, these various disadvantages, which again only apply to places like Greenland rather than to the, uh, to the colonizers. And what this ultimately, ultimately means is uh, uh, regardless of, of what Greenland as a country chooses, it, it, it has to be Greenland's choice. It has to be uh, 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 come down to uh, to, to really understanding the, the, the power relationships uh, which are involved in all this. And, uh, and, and it's really about choosing a Greenlandic future and seeing, uh, I would say, that Greenlandicness doesn't just mean a sort of colonially built vision of Greenlandicness, but maybe identifying what it is which, uh, which, which, which could be a truly Greenlandic future. That's all for me here. Yeah, thank you very much, Adam, for your presentation. And I, I'm quite sure that uh, there will be uh, quite a lot of uh, questions, remarks. And I mean, it really is a presentation which invites for discussion. So I think we should have a conversation uh, uh, um, after the coffee break, should we say so? So I think we will have a, a short break now of, what should we say, 10 minutes? 10 minutes and there is some some cake there some coffee and some tea and then we will gather again here and uh, yeah